Sahara Hekopian. The Armenian genocide is a little known atrocity of the First World War. What was the scale and effect of the event? Actually, it is very little known in this country. And when I talk to people about the Armenian genocide, they have literally no clue. When did this happen? Uh, who was involved? How many victims? The usual questions. And of course, because there is a lack of knowledge, there is also a lack of interest in that genocide in the way you would, for instance, with the Jewish Holocaust or the Rwandan genocide, where instantly people recognize and therefore associate and empathize with the victims. Whereas with the Armenians, first of all, Armenians are a community and you're not really too sure who are they, what are they, are they Christian, are they not, where do they come from? from and then you're going back you're peeling back the pages of history for roughly a hundred years in order to talk about this genocide so indeed it's a little bit what we call a forgotten genocide or what Jeff Robertson who's a barrister a QC calls an inconvenient genocide it's a forgotten genocide because few people know about it and uh, it was an atrocious genocide where Roughly most of the Armenian population living in Anatolian lands in Ottoman Turkey were basically killed or lost their lives or deported from the country. And uh, figures, and those are credible figures, not Armenian figures, which might be a little bit more romantic, uh, credible figures by historians have said that anything between a million and a million and a half Armenians uh, were killed or lost their lives uh, during that genocide. And most of the Armenians who used to live uh, in uh, Ottoman Turkey under the cover of World War I fled or were forced to flee. And hence you see the diaspora everywhere. And when you talk to a diasporan Armenian versus an Armenian who lives in the Republic in the Southern Caucasus, then chances are nine out of 10 he or she would trace their roots to the genocide. Why do you think it is that it's, it is such a forgotten genocide? It's a forgotten genocide because people have short memories. And at that time, people were not so aware of what was happening. I always think that if the Armenian genocide were to take place today, with the social media we have, with the uh, press as keen as it is for 24-7 news, then there is no way you could get away with the atrocities and the heinous crimes that were committed at the time. But then it didn't carry, I mean, there were Christian missionaries. There's an organization called Bible Lands, which has changed its name. It calls itself now Embrace the Middle East. And it has a huge tome, a book, in which it talks about its own Christian missionaries from the UK, from the United States and elsewhere, who were in Ottoman Turkey at the time, who saw what was happening, who wrote about it, but there was no response really. Uh, the same could be said of many others, the American ambassador in Turkey, Morgenthau, uh, the German photographers who themselves, when they saw the scale of that genocide, were themselves horrified by it. So there is that lack of uh, transmission of the events. Another thing, of course, which always strikes me is that, like most things in this world, the Armenian genocide is a political uh, subject. In other words, if you're going to talk about the genocide, then inevitably you're going to uh, point a finger of accusation at the predecessor Ottoman Turkish regime. And the way the world is these days, you wouldn't want to anger Turkey because there are always vested interests. So if you have a small community, I mean, if you take all Armenians across the world, you have something like uh, at most 15 million Armenians versus a powerful NATO ally, which is a strategic ally of the West, you wouldn't want to anger them. And I've had that experience on many occasions where I've tried to push our own government here to recognize it in Parliament, helped by some uh, MPs who have been sympathetic to the cause, and it's been like uh, knocking your head on a brick wall because they just don't want to go there because the reaction from the uh, Turkish side is quite furious. And this is why you have many, many countries who have recognized it, including France, including the European Parliament, as well as uh, countries further afield. But countries like the United Kingdom and the United States 
and Israel, funnily enough, which is the irony of it all, in my opinion, have not uh, yet uh, recognized it. But you look at the United States, uh, two-thirds of the states within the Union have individually passed recognition uh, laws. But when it comes to the federal government, it hasn't happened. However, uh, when I talk about UK and USA and then Israel, Germany, which itself has showed so much contrition for the Holocaust and its involvement with it, has recognized the Armenian genocide. So it's really more of a political than a human issue that has to be taken on board. So what, what challenges of recognition, justice and um, reconciliation still persist? Well, it's a very difficult uh, subject to talk about reconciliation and forgiveness uh, with Armenians because the first thing they would say, what reconciliation, what forgiveness, when the perpetrator of the crime has not even recognized the crime, let alone shown repentance or contrition for that uh, crime. So how would you be able to reach out to that person and say, let us try and reach some sort of an understanding between each other. Let us uh, leave bygones to be bygones and move forward. It's very difficult. It's human nature. I mean, my family, half my family were decimated during the genocide. So it's genetic to every Armenian, especially as I said earlier in the diaspora, to have to deal with issues of reconciliation and forgiveness no matter where you come from, whether you come from a principled ethical background, whether you come from a humanistic background, whether you come from a Christian uh, background and you read everything in scripture about forgiveness, although mind you there's a lot in scripture about fire and brimstone as well. So in a sense it's, it's quite difficult for Armenians to struggle with that and every time you make a step forward there's always something or somebody that pulls you back two steps. Mm -hmm. Have we learned anything from this atrocity uh, that we can relate to modern day events? In a sense, yes, we can. First uh, lesson that I always draw is how politics subsumes everything. And we're living in a very politicized world. We have to a large extent, despite all the problems we'd had over decades and centuries, there has always been a community of values in the world that have prevailed. I think at the moment, the way things are going, that community of values is disintegrating. And we are coming face to face with a native nationalistic populism that basically says what I want and what is good for me matters, the rest doesn't matter. And when you have to deal with that, in my opinion, you're also dealing with the very ethos of the Christian faith, but you're also this, uh, dealing with uh, human relations uh, between people. If you start thinking of only myself and I don't care what happens to the neighbor, that is quite uh, frightening. But also, I think, and I've said this and others far, far more learned than I have said it about genocide, is that uh, there's an American historian who said that if people had woken up to what was happening to the Armenians uh, during that period, which started really in 1894 and ended in 1923, but the really the crux of it when the huge number of people were killed was 1915, right in the middle of the war, uh, if somebody had shown more resolve then, maybe the following genocides would not have happened in the way uh, they have happened uh, in our own history. So perhaps it's true, perhaps it's not, but I think it also, what frightens me these days when I look about all those uh, governments across the world, whether in the Middle East, North Africa and Gulf regions, whether in, in Western Europe, uh, these ideas of people putting up fences, putting up barricades, excluding the other, if you have a different color of skin, if you have a different belief, if you have different faith, if your values are not like mine, if you're not somebody who speaks my language well enough, then you're not one of my tribe. And we have gone into a tribalism that is frightening because 
pushed to the extreme, that could be very, very dangerous. And this is why when I talk about the Armenian genocide and when I recount my own stories and what I'm going to say today as co-speaker uh, at this event organized by the Chiswick Churches for Justice and Peace, I'm not going to pontificate. I'm not going to sit there as a lawyer and start talking about the legal, the political, the anthropological dimensions of genocide. I'm going to take stories Stories that began with my grandfather, maternal grandfather, all the way to stories that have affected me personally, and then draw lessons from those uh, stories. Maybe there are about five or six of them. They're only 20 minutes. And then after that, sort of come with two or three little principles that would be like guidelines uh, for people to think of when they think of the Armenian genocide. But it's I think Armenians are hungry for recognition, not only recognition in a legal, parliamentary, political sense, by recognition by the people. And as you said, people are not doing that. And if you go to Turkey these days, which to my opinion is the first country that should wake up to what happened in its own backyard, if you go to Turkey, the majority of the people do not have a clue as to what happened to the Armenians. They know that vaguely, if you go and really uh, dust off the, uh, the recent history, you see a whole treasure of Armenian churches, Armenian streets, Armenian institutes, Armenian businesses, the best uh, carpet uh, dealers in Ottoman Turkey were Armenians, all these suddenly disappeared. And people know that yes, there was an Armenian presence here, but they're not too sure where it is, why it disappeared, they immediately get very tense when you use the G word and say, well, what about the genocide? But also, if you look at their history books, there is a whole blank uh, chapter that does not even refer to the Armenians and what happens to them. So if you're not being taught it at school, if you're not being taught it in the street, then how are you going to be able to know about it, think about it, and empathize with those people who used to be Turkish nationals like you? They had Turkish Ottoman uh, passports. These people were not parachuted into Turkey and told, you know, like the refugees in Europe coming from Libya, coming from Syria or wherever, they, they weren't told, oh, these are people, they don't have anywhere to live, get on with it, tough luck. These people were rich people and they were rounded up on the 24th of April 1915, uh, over 200 of the cream of the cream, the intellectuals, the businessmen, the clergy, and they were all shot. And that is how it started. And then from there on, it was a process of getting rid of the Armenians because at that time there was an idea that we want to Turkify, we want to homogenize the community, we want the country to be Turkish, we don't want minorities. So the largest uh, minority community numerically that suffered were the Armenians, but so did the Syriacs or the Syrian Orthodox uh, Christians, and so did the Greeks in lesser numbers. But for me as a lawyer, numbers are not what count. What counts is the intent. The Convention on Genocide doesn't say if you pass the number 5,000, it is genocide. Under 5,000, you can't say it. It says, what was the intent of the perpetrator? The intent of the perpetrator was to get rid of something called Armenian. And there are Armenian officials in history books. Winston Churchill has it in his own book when he referred to the Armenian genocide at that time. Uh, they were saying, we only want to spare one Armenian in uh, Turkey, and that Armenian will be in the museum. So there is that sense of how can you actually reach out to people, and when people sort of come and talk about all those lofty ideas, oh, let's reach out, let's forgive each other, let's give ourselves a hug, let's do the uh, Christian ukulele, uh, it doesn't really gel with most people who still feel it in their uh, bodies and in their genes and who still have histories and stories from their uh, great-grandmothers and great-grandfathers. Now, of course, as those generations die out and new generations come up in Europe, in the United States, in Australia, in the Middle East, elsewhere, slowly but surely that memory is fading. And that's one of the fears of the Armenian community, that eventually 
uh, Turkish denialism will win the day, not because the facts will be disproven, but because those people who can address those facts will no longer be living. Dr. Hakopian, thank you very much for talking to us and we look forward to your talk. My pleasure. Thank you, Chris. Thank you.